This is kind of a full circle event. Many of us have gathered in this room and at Theater Parker and other meeting houses to sort of face down the, the threat of the West Roxbury lateral pipeline. Um, it was in the fall of 2014. Uh, you know, I see Ricky Harvey here. She was like one of the sort of early people who sort of heard about this pipeline that was sort of uh, coming down the tracks at our community. Um, and maybe I'm, I'm curious how many people were able to participate sometime in the last couple of years in a vigil at the West Roxbury pipeline of some kind. So a lot of people here. And how many people in the room actually were among the 198 people who, who risked arrest or got arrested at the... So that's a, that's a significant... Yeah. How many people supported somebody else to be able to be present? Possible. Okay, well, so this is really a celebration of, of our efforts together over the last uh, couple of years. And... Um, you know, I kind of want to uh, lift up a number, of, you know, we can lift up enough, the role of a number of people, and I think we'll do that tonight. Um, but we, when we set up this forum, when Annie scheduled this forum and Marla, we were talking, that the, we thought maybe the trial would be underway, and that tonight would be a good night to bring in some of the expert witnesses that will be testifying in, in defense, including uh, James Hansen and Bill McKibben, and, uh, but, we didn't have, as you know, the trial did not move forward, but we have our expert community witnesses and defendants to share some stories, so we're excited about that. And I want to introduce uh, uh, the youngest defendant uh, who has a special connection to this church. I should say she was probably in 14 Christmas pageants, starting as a little <laughs> lamb and working her way up to be a wise man, you know? So anyway, so Nora Collins. <laughs> Hi all, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, something my dad did not include is that this is very much a family affair. He was one of the first people to get arrested back in 2014, 2015. 2015. And since then my mother, Trisha Brennan, has also gotten arrested as a part of clergy actions in Boston and my bonus mother is filming, hi Mary, <laughs> um, also got arrested. So this is very much, I'm very much a product of of this family and also of this building. Um, I was indeed a, a lamb and a <laughs> wise man. I never quite made it to Mary, always. <laughs> not quite fit ready, but, uh, <laughs> but tonight I'm here as a felon, so I guess, <laughs> as a co-defendant. Um, yeah, uh, this, this community in Jamaica Plain has been um, really supportive of the movement in West Roxbury and this forum has held different events in support of it and we're so grateful for you all coming out tonight and for being in this space which helped raise me. Thank you. Mary Boyle, as you can see in this banner up here, uh, that's her at the end of the pipeline there, pushing back. Uh, so I'm curious um, to hear uh, what it, it means to you to be able to, to look back on that and, and what difference it's made in the way that you see the world or the way that, that your neighborhood feels or how you all work together going forward. And if you think, what, what you think was accomplished even, besides this necessity defense thing, right? I know that the pipeline is in service um, and that, that hurts and we're still following that gas. Uh, is, there, is there any good remaining though, <laughs> even though that pipeline is in service? Instead of going to lunch, I had a family commitment yesterday afternoon, so I was going to take the bus from Forest Hills. Uh, normally, I would take the ones that go up Center Street to West Roxbury. There was none in sight, but there was a 34 that goes on Washington Street. It would mean I would walk a bit more than a mile to get to my house from the bus stop, but it seemed like the best option. And then, ironically, when I stepped off at Grove Street, I was walking the route of the pipeline. You know, I've driven it many times and often think what that little patch in the street means. There's a little yellow patch every once in a while on the street that says danger, pipeline, call such and such a number for spectra. But now I was walking and going by where John was arrested and where Dan did this and where the police were lined up with their bicycles. And it was so touching. It was sad as could be to be walking along that, and yet beautiful at the same time, if you can imagine. 
because of all of the effort that people put into uh, saying no to this assault on our community. During the process of this, was also forming this organization, the Climate Disobedience Center, to, to, to carry on and support this work in many other parts of the country. So uh, let's we'll give a warm welcome to Marla Markham. Last week, um, we had heard, so very late in the process, from the prosecution that they had decided to, to drop the criminal charges against these defendants to civil infractions, which is like a parking ticket, um, which means you're not entitled to a jury trial, as you probably know, for a parking ticket, right? And so, which, which meant that we thought we had lost all opportunity to, to bring this claim of a necessity to act in order to prevent a greater harm before the court. Uh, just by having lost the opportunity to bring it before a jury. Uh, but, but when we uh, entered court yesterday morning, uh, the, the, our attorneys asked if, um, if perhaps the defendants could be allowed to give statements. So you heard what, what Kathy's statement was about just now. Brief statements about why they had taken the action that they had taken. And um, I'm going to invite Tim now to come and um, tell you what he said to the judge, because he can frame it the rest of the way, I think, by telling us what he asked the judge to do. Tim to Christopher. All right. So as Marla said, we didn't really know what to expect uh, going into court yesterday. But uh, I knew that this was a group that had spent a lot of time preparing to make this argument um, over the past year and a half with the help of a, a big team of lawyers that put a lot of effort into this from the National Lawyers Guild and from the Climate Defense Project. Um, and, and so I, I went into it with the intent to still use whatever opportunity we could to, to get this case out there, even if instead of being able to present a, a full comprehensive case over the course of a week or more in the courtroom, um, we instead had two minutes apiece to make that case. And, and so I asked the judge that if she would uh, find us not guilty by reason of necessity and, and let her know that we had prepared this necessity defense and that all this evidence was out there, that we could easily meet all the elements of the necessity defense, which include that, that there is an imminent harm, that we're acting to prevent that imminent harm, and that, that our actions cause less harm than that imminent harm causes that there are no reasonable legal alternatives, and that we have a reasonable expectation that our actions could actually prevent the harm in question. And, and we had lots of experts prepared to give testimony about how this pipeline represented an imminent harm. In, in one case, if the pipeline didn't work as intended, if there was some sort of disaster or explosion, uh, with, with the pipeline being right there next to a, an active blasting quarry. But, but also the imminent harm if the pipeline did work as intended and continued to, to exacerbate the fracking crisis in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Ohio, and, and the disastrous impacts that those communities are suffering, and continued to allow natural gas to flow through that pipeline where it was burned and would continue exacerbating the climate crisis, which we could not afford to do that there was imminent harm no matter what with this pipeline. And, and furthermore, that a lot had been tried, that, that a lot of the folks in this room with the, with the uh, campaign there in West Roxbury had tried a lot of things to fight this pipeline. And then in fact, a city councilor, Michelle Wu, was ready to testify on our behalf, in, in our defense, about how they had tried everything they possibly could within the legal structure to try to stop this pipeline. And there was nothing that they could do because the fossil fuel industry has such a tight control over our government. And, and because we no longer have an active functioning democracy because of that corporate influence. And we we're prepared to present that testimony of, uh, of how we have in fact lost a democracy in this country. And we don't really, we don't have uh, the ability for communities to protect themselves within the legal structure from these kinds of threats like this pipeline. You know, we, had, um, we had political scientists ready to, to give that testimony. We had folks like Bill McKibben ready to give the testimony of, of things like the Exxon New campaign, of how they've 
funded climate denial for so long and, and done so much to corrupt our government. Um, and, and also just the, the massive amounts that people have tried beyond just this campaign, but, but in the broader climate movement, the, the extensive amount that people have tried to try to avert the climate crisis, to, to try to uh, restrict new fossil fuel development. And, and I you know, told the judge that our, one of our big challenges in preparing this case was just trying to put some sort of reasonable time limit on listing all the things that we have <laughs> tried in the climate movement. Because there's so much that has been tried for decades, for more than 30 years. People have actively worked on this. People have poured their hearts out on this. People have formed organizations. They've, they've garnered resources. They've, they've developed all different sorts of strategies. You know, and people often love to throw out critiques like, oh, you shouldn't be talking about it this way, you should be talking about it that way. You know, like, you shouldn't be trying to scare people, you should be talking about economics, or you, know, you should be talking about, talking about it from a faith perspective, or whatever. Like, we've tried it all. People have, <laughs> people have explained it every way you could possibly explain it, to, to the point of absurdity. I mean, most of us who have been doing climate activism for a while have done some absurd things, because we've tried everything else. And that's, that's why we get to this point of engaging in civil disobedience. And, and perhaps one of, the, one of the parts of that necessity defense that I'm most disappointed that we weren't able to put on this time was, was that, that final element of the necessity defense of having a reasonable expectation that our actions could actually avert the, the harm in question here. So, so in this case, that meant a, a reasonable expectation that forming together in a social movement and engaging in strategies like civil disobedience could actually have stopped this pipeline. And in this case, we, we didn't. But we can make a very strong case for why social movements can be so powerful, why they have been so powerful throughout the history of our country when, when there, there was no way for people to effect justice through legal means and when they had to step outside of those legal means and engage in tactics like civil disobedience. That's how we've got overcome so many of the injustices in our nation's history. And, and it's why we knew that we could be powerful in this case, where even if, though we didn't stop the West Roxbury pipeline, while this campaign was going on with sustained resistance day after day, Kinder Morgan, on the other side of the state, canceled their plans for a, for a pipeline at the same time. And now, for the past few months, we keep getting one public statement after another from natural gas companies and pipeline companies that are, that are speaking to their shareholders and to their industry groups saying every single project we try to do gets actively fought by, by communities and by this movement. We get sustained resistance. We, we get sustained resistance every time we try to do something. And these companies are actually talking to their shareholders saying that it's it's shifting their fundamental business model. It's shifting the way that they're doing business because communities like this are, are fighting these kinds of fights all over the country. And, and that's a really exciting and inspiring thing to, to, to be a part of. And for me, one of the, the big lessons after seeing what happened yesterday with, where the judge only gave us two minutes apiece and so we could just spit something out and the next person moved on. And that wasn't a scenario that we had prepared for. But when all of us put our testimonies together, it presented this incredibly comprehensive um, story and narrative that, that really covered all of our bases in, in a very concise, timely way. But, but we were able to step into that opportunity right when it formed, right there, and, and make the most of it. And, and get that story across to the judge to the point that, that she did rule us technically not responsible, which is like being acquitted, by reason of this, the necessity defense. And she made it clear that she accepted that, that necessity argument, that we did have a necessity to act. Um, and, and it was uh, a lesson for me in how we can prepare and train for the uncertain and unexpected which I think is a lot of our task at this point in the climate movement, uh, when, when uncertainty is such a certainty for our future, 
And at this point in our political climate, where it's hard to even predict what our political situation is going to look like a week or two from now, you know, much less over the course of the campaigns that we're fighting, we, we know we're going to be dealing with lots of unpredictable situations. And, and we might not fit neatly into a certain scenario, but we, we also know that we can train ourselves and, and build the kind of communities and teams like this to, to be able to make the most of whatever situation arises. And, and so Tim, that's exciting for me. Will you introduce both? Yes. <laughs> and so I was, I was part of the, the mass graves action that we did in West Roxbury, which is um, the painting back there by Mary Russell of invoking the mass grave in Pakistan that they dug with their heat wave in 2016. Um, and, and in that trench with me that, that day was a, a bunch of other folks, um, one of whom is our next speaker, Callista Womack, who was also one of our pro se defendants and, and put a lot of time and effort into being ready to, to make our case in the courtroom. Right. For y'all, I'll mostly just recount what I said in court um, about what I did and why I did it. But first, I want to acknowledge someone who's not here today who was also in that trench with us, and that's Sophia Wolanski, um, who was one of the youngest people, I think, involved with this by far, and a big part of this for me as well throughout. So thanks to her for that. Um, for my part, um, I happened onto this action kind of haphazardly. I came along with a friend um, as support one day and saw what was going on and heard the story about all of the local opposition to the pipeline, all of the elected representatives' opposition, the court case against that didn't seem to be stopping construction on what was clearly an unwanted and dangerous project on seemingly every level. So for me, it was just an absolute no-brainer to be involved and to try to help in whatever way possible to stop this from happening. Um, it's part of my new home community. It seemed like the responsible civic duty. Um, and it was also an important part of my faith practice because I grew up um, in a very spiritual, earth-oriented home where I was taught that taking care of the environment I live in, taking care of the soil and the air and the water and the trees is my primary responsibility to my family and to my neighbors, to my children and to my grandparents. Those were the values that my parents passed on to me and that's my daily practice um, as part of my spirituality. So as I sat in the trench that day, I felt profound peace there um, with the soil and the rocks looking up. It was a blue sky um, with some clouds, but mostly clear and sunny. And w from where I was sitting, I couldn't see the police or the barriers anymore. It was just the soil and the rocks and the sky and the trees and the birds and the trees. Um, so it was very, it was beautiful. It was serene and it reminded me even more of what I was connected to and why I was doing what I was doing. And because I learned um, that there was this high-pressure fracked gas pipeline flowing through residential West Roxbury right next to an active quarry, right, that has weekly blasts, and that all nine city councilors and my mayor had voted against. And this was still moving forward despite the daily vigils by Mary and Bill and other residents of West Roxbury. And so that was an initial, you know, real push to get involved. And I just felt threatened for my own community living 10 minutes away from this hazardous project. And the day that I got arrested uh, was what Tim de Christopher has already referred to as the mass graves action. And that was in response to a photo that had just been released that summer from Pakistan of mass graves that were being built for victims of a recent heat wave that were related to global climate change. And that photo, as has been pointed out, was turned into a banner that we can see here that um, was held up that day. And one of the things that people felt in seeing that photo was this terrifying resemblance of that trench um, and the trench that was being built in the streets of West Roxbury and a very visual representation of 
of the connection of these trenches, right? Of the way that the fossil fuel industry and their hold on our government and our consumption in this country are creating trenches like that across the ocean, are, are part of something that is absolutely a killing machine and wanting to reject our participation in that and our complicity. And, and since getting arrested um, in the summer of 2016, I've lived and worked for six months on the US-Mexico border. And so it, it's become very personal and I've seen with my own eyes the ways that uh, climate change is fostering and sometimes prompting the destabilization of communities and, and, for, and forcing this refugee crisis and this migration crisis on our southern border. And it's, it's a very real connection when there's a drought because of fossil fuels and it doesn't rain, your crops don't grow and people need to live and people need to support their families. And so men and women are coming across the US-Mexico border in mass who have relatively small carbon footprints themselves, right? And it's, it's because of trenches like the one in West Roxbury and all that they are connected to and all that they represent. So when we talk about the mass graze action, it's, it's to link that. And what I said to our judge at the end was I just looked her in the eye and I said, I, I really, I didn't know what else to do to halt this construction, but to put myself in the trench and I don't think I did anything wrong. What Nora didn't mention is that we could all see that the judge teared up a little bit when Nora was speaking to her. And it was the moment when she really seemed to start to pay attention deeply. So I'm Nathan Phillips, and in August of 2016, I was with a group of seven. And we had to go a circuitous way around so that we could get in the one-way direction and position ourselves in a place where we could stop the car open the doors and all get out in a fairly expeditious manner so that the police wouldn't converge on us and move us away. So we managed to get into the trench and uh, got arrested. We went into the wagon and had a, what seemed like a half hour ride with turns and very disorienting and then did the, the fingerprints and spent probably about five hours, I guess, in the holding cell, something like that before we were released. Our group of seven, something that really um, I thought a lot about was the intergenerationality of us. And Brown mentioned being a great grandfather. And I've got two kids. We have a 17-year-old daughter and a 12-year-old son. And I think a lot about how they think about where we are today. And so fast forward to the, to the trial and the necessity defense and I talked about the three elements of the necessity defense. I talked about the imminent danger of a corporation not having a safety plan if there's an explosion. It do didn't exist, it doesn't exist. That they don't have a, they're not consistent with a safety plan for our climate. The trial was really about us and the next generation. And that's why I was so proud to be with, with Brown that it's about our kids and it's about future generations and we're, we're still on trial so the matter wasn't finished yesterday and the trial still goes on. Rachel Eccles is in the audience, I see you. Rachel was a student at Boston University and graduated last year. We worked together on the divestment campaign and she poured so much energy and effort into that and we won we made a partial victory that um, my university divested from coal and tar sands. They did not go far enough. And we need to go faster. Our generation, my generation, needs to move faster. The, the youth are showing the leadership, and I see too much of my generation uh, either apathy or status quo, and it's not good enough. And that's really why I, that was the necessity for me, was to, to break out of what I see too much of in my generation, which is going with, with the flow. And so I conveyed that to, to the judge. 
And I guess I'll just finish by saying that as a climate scientist and an academic, we publish papers, they do have some use, and, and science is so important. It tells us what the choices are that will allow the planet to remain habitable and those that don't. But it's not enough. Facts are not enough. Catherine Hayhoe is a evangelical Christian climate scientist who's made this point over and over again that there's got to be something deeper than telling people the facts of climate change. Uh, they need to know about us as humans and we have to find common ground. And in this West Roxbury lateral pipeline struggle, I have come to meet the most amazing people. Uh, I've never been in so many churches in my life. <laughs> from the Parker Church to this church and the Climate Disobedience Center. The three founders are all trained as theologians, ordained ministers, uh, uh, Reverend Small there, Miriama, just to see the leadership of the faith community, it's just awe-inspiring. And um, it does bring tears to my eyes. The music of um, uh, Rabbi Friedman, um, the, uh, the tide is rising. I can't not tear up when that, and Reverend, you play that so well. <laughs> uh, so just that the, uh, the, the depth, the spiritual depth uh, that I've experienced in this movement has, has energized me and is carrying me forward as we go to these other battles, it's like whack-a-mole, they're all over the place. But as, as Tim has, has said, we're just showing up everywhere and we're not going away. And the fossil fuel industry knows it and um, they're frightened. Um, they're still gonna try, they're gonna go down fighting, but we're gonna be there to contest them every single step of the way, so. Because National Grid is a very important organization, our so-called public investor-owned utility, um, is building a one-mile pipeline through the heart of our city, and so far they have one customer, which is probably the priciest, most ridiculous, what do you call them, Chuck? They're uh, well... Storage. Well storage vehicles. <laughs> it's, it's, it, the average condo price is gonna be $6 million. We're, gonna, this, we're building a mile-long pipeline. Now, they probably have some other luxury condos along the way lined up, but so far there's one. We fought them. Uh, the mayor kind of slipped and slide and said, it's not really my pipeline. We need to convince the mayor. Uh, right in 2010, when the uh, Deepwater Horizon blew up, and I became an activist. And I learned about fracking <clears throat> and became an activist. And um, so many things I've seen in so many communities, people coming out, realizing that that's, you know, who they are, that they're, that they're activists, that they're gonna work with each other, that they're gonna come together and they're gonna try and stop things and alter things. And so it happens and it works. Um, right now, you guys have done something and at the same time, there's a pipeline that is functioning, that's in place, that you guys wanted to stop. But it's kind of like, it's kind of like in The Hobbit, you know, when you see smog and they found the little chink in the armor, <laughs> okay? And you're looking for the right shot, except you have to shoot from all sorts of different angles, okay? Because we're, we're using this necessity defense and, and we've maybe found that little chink. And I can tell you that this pipeline that you guys were trying to fight extends across Massachusetts into Connecticut, into New York State, and I was arrested along with other people um, in New York State trying to stop the same pipeline as it passed within 100 feet of Indian Point Nuclear Power Plant, which is a decrepit nuclear power plant that is gonna be retired uh, within the next four years, but which has uh, uh, spent fuel rods and little canisters all over its grounds that will be there for a long, long time. 
And as all of you know, who've paid attention to this issue here, the blast radius from a large scale pipeline is a lot further than 100 feet. And the damage that would, would happen uh, in that area just dwarfs anything that, that we would care to think about. And I think we all know this. So, you know, we might not have gotten our trial here, but there's gonna be a trial sometime in July. And we're sure as hell going for necessity defense. And I'm damn well gonna be borrowing your witnesses, okay? <laughs> and we're gonna be trying to set that deeper precedent because we're building and we're building and we're building and we're trying to get this movement and we need numbers and we need commitment. And just keep in mind, this pipeline started somewhere and it's meant to go somewhere, right? And that place where it started is essentially Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is in many ways completely ruined. It has been fracked to death, okay? And that stuff is coming up and it's, it's going out and these companies, they want to, to uh, turn it into liquefied natural gas and they want to, to send it out. So um, they also want to put it in storage in different places. So how many of you guys know what We Are Seneca Lake is? Okay, Annie, the person that you scheduled, Sandra Steingraber, is an awesome person, okay? And she was part of We Are Seneca Lake and they succeeded, okay? There, there are abandoned salt caverns in, uh, near Ithaca, New York, in the, in, the, in the Finger Lakes area, which is a beautiful area. And for some of you who probably don't know this, it's actually the second biggest uh, winery area in the country, second only to California, all right? But this abandoned salt caverns, this company came in and said, oh, that looks like a perfect place to store natural gas. We're just gonna pump it in there and pump it in there and pump it in there. It's gonna be like a giant bomb. They didn't use that particular word, but that's what it was. And We Are Seneca Lake was the people in that community showing up day after day after day at the entrance, getting in the way, blocking it, being arrested, and either going to jail or paying sizable fines. But they kept at it, and they kept at it, and they kept at it, and they won. That company left. If we can't get this pipeline out of this community, go after the things that that pipeline is feeding. Go after the politicians that support that pipeline passively or impassively, whichever one it is, okay? Go after the organizations that finance those, uh, those gas companies. Just expand, expand, expand your horizons because you, we cannot wait for the politicians to come around and save us. They will not. This is wagging the dog. We control them, but only when we come out in numbers and we're organized as Marla and so many of other people here. Tim, countless names have organized this community. Just keep at it and we will win. Thank you. And I realized that the work that I was doing as a musician had to be connected every day of my life to doing something about climate change. And I've undertaken a variety of projects and I won't bore you with all of them, but I do, uh, uh, Mary and I are both people with signs. And uh, I, I do a daily vigil at a heavily trafficked intersection near my house in Medford, and I'm on 131 weeks and counting. Now I think an hour every day. And I got called some, I tell you, oh. God. We get the good stuff too, but I've gotten called all kinds of things. I realized as the, over the course of the years that I've been involved in activism, I've had plenty of chances to engage in uh, conversation with denialists, with people who deny the uh, reality of human-caused climate change. And one of the things that uh, I have noticed is that the psychological mechanisms of denial of climate change are identical to the psychological and epistemological mechanisms of denial of systemic economic inequality, of systemic racism, of systemic misogyny, of systemic homophobia, transphobia, all of the things, all of those forms of denial are structurally identical. And that's a powerful lesson. I'm very bad at uh, some of these arguments because I tend to get snotty and sarcastic. I take my hat off to the people who manage to stay calm and not put, put the denialists down. Um, 
When it came my time to talk to the judge, I said roughly, Your Honor, I wish to address two things. The first is that over all of the many thousands of years that human beings have been on this planet, we've been engaged in a long and slow and very halting three steps forward and two and 99 one hundredths of a step back progression. We've gradually been making it better. We've learned. And we've taken the first steps toward making a civilization that could work for human beings. We're still doing it very poorly, but we're starting to get a glimpse of how we're doing it poorly and how we're doing it well. And that's manifested in the products of our art, in the products of our culture, of our architecture, and even in the civic infrastructure that results in such concepts as the rule of law exemplified in this very courtroom. And those things are put under threat by climate change. Not just charismatic megafauna, not just little animals somewhere under a rock, not just the ice caps, not just, you know, some people somewhere on the other side of the world, but this courtroom, everything, the idea of a rule of law, all of that is put under threat. The next thing I said, this derived from my experience in looking at denialists. I looked at the arguments of uh, the people who thought abolitionists, like Theodore Parker, they thought the abolitionists were crazy. You're never going to be able to, to overcome a slavery-based economy. And besides, don't you want progress? It's never going to work. And besides, you wear cotton that's been harvested and processed by a slave economy. Aren't you? A, you're a hypocrite. It's the same stuff. You're an environmentalist. Oh, do you drive a car? It's the same stuff. And I raised the point to the judge that Massachusetts, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the state that's been my home since I was a small boy, was in the forefront of the resistance against slavery and the abolitionist movement. And it placed Massachusetts in a position of moral ascendancy. And it is time, or it would be time, for Massachusetts to stand again for the right and for the correct and morally appropriate course of action to reject exploitative and immoral sources of energy, because that's what fossil fuels are. So that we imagine that activism happens because individuals who are heroic out of nowhere step forward and have a kind of courage. And I just, in this experience, as has been true in virtually every experience of social justice and civil disobedience, it rests on so many shoulders that you don't see. But, and part of those shoulders and that training and that community that's built makes it possible so that when you're in the trench, and you've trained all the people to be there so they know that they, what they're prepared for and their conviction has taken there. When all of a someone, sudden someone drops into the trench that you've never seen before, <laughs> you have a safety net to hold that person whose voice is so important. And I just want you to hear that voice and then I'll be back in a minute. And that's Carrie Labrador. My name is Carrie Labrador, and I thank you for allowing me to come and speak with you tonight to share my story on my decision to help put forth efforts in delaying the construction of the West Roxbury Lateral Pipeline via my act of nonviolent direct action. It started in April of 2016 when I read an article about Standing Rock residents opposing the placement of the Dakota Access Pipeline, which was being set to run under the Missouri River the same Missouri River that is thousands of people's main source of drinking, bathing, and cooking water. <clears throat> at this very moment, it was all being put at risk, and their resistance was born. I was keeping myself updated with their movement from then on, because I knew it was about to get real, and because I knew these natives were not about to back down. Not this time. 
Fast forward to August 31st, 2016, and I watched Happy American Horse via Facebook Live lock himself to the machinery located at one of the dig sites and open the door for many others to follow suit in a similar way. Then on September 3rd, 2016, again, watching Facebook Live, I saw elders, women, and children being pepper sprayed and having a doc attack dogs set on them for simply standing for their water and trying to stop the enemy from laying their killer pipe. Desecrating their sacred burial sites with the construction of this ugly pipe was where they were headed. By mid-September, Stan and Rock put out a national call to action. Wherever you are, join the fight, even from your own community. And it just so happens, that's when I discovered resist the West Roxbury pipeline. <laughs> and after seeing they were holding a prayer ceremony in solidarity with Stan and Rock, I left a message of thanks for doing such. And I was instantly invited to come and join them on September 20th, 2016. If I wanted to, and to attend the protest at the work site afterwards, as well if I wanted to. I was all for it. Although I missed the prayer, I was there in time to join the protest, and upon getting to the site, my heart sunk and instantly hurt looking at the sear of a future scar sitting across my sacred mother's flesh. Protesting was no longer an option. At this point, the act to non-violently disobey was now my only option. In 10 seconds, I heard the voices of four ancestors telling me to jump, to get in there and fight for what I know is right. So I did. And that's where my resistance was born. For those unaware, I'm a Native woman, a proud descendant of the Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy tribes, each of which is part of the five tribes of the Wabanaki Confederacy. I've lived on two different Indian reservations throughout my life thus far, and I've seen firsthand the pain caused to my people by a broken government who has failed more by, who has fueled more by greed than integrity or empathy. I come from a people ripped away from their homes and families by colonizers trying to kill the Indian and save the man. And they come from a people who were raped, pillaged, and murdered by colonizers in order to steal their land and claim it as their own, to do as they please. And here we are, 500 years later, and the greed has only intensified, while the grandchildren of these ancestors now finish a fight that they bred us for in their own way. Only today, the grandchildren have allies, other brave front runners willing to stand beside us as we fight, and many are sitting in this room right now. And once again, I thank each of you. So you see, for me, this fight is personal. This whole fight against the fossil fuel industry is personal. And it's personal because greedy corporate owners like Kelsey Warren are destroying the very earth that I was raised to respect and value from the teachings of my elders. And it's personal because there are a world full of children who deserve the future's promise to them when they were born. In finality, I have a message for all those greedy corporate self-proclaimed head honchos out there. You may take comfortability in choosing profit over people, but the fact remains. My answers kept the fire of the fight burning in each of their grandchildren. And we're here to share our flame and ignite the world to choose people over profit while also protecting the sacred. Yeah. We'll allow them. And because Carrie has uh, done her ancestors so proud, that she's also an ancestor worth descending from. I just like her children to stand so you get to see where we're heading. If you just stand up, the three of you. <laughs> In my own uh, testimony, or my own words that I shared with the judge, um, I talked about the fact that our being there that day was standing on the shoulders of so many. And I opened acknowledging, as Carrie has in a certain way, that the land the court was built on was land that had been stood on and cared for by Native peoples long before it was taken from them and that part of our being part of this sustained campaign was that if Native people, many of whom are still here today, had prevailed, we would not be in the position that we were in, and that that 
was as a result of conquest and violence and a kind of corporate and human violence um, that resurrected itself in this West Roxbury pipeline. I also invoked the spirit of Rosa Parks because for many of us, we have grown up with that iconic picture of this tired woman who just happened to sit down. But of course, she didn't just happen to sit down. She had been at the Highlander Center for six weeks before she sat down. She was part of the NAACP, head of the chapter before she participated. And so her participation was part of a campaign. And because a necessity defense relies on the notion that you have tried everything, tried all the other things, I talked about that we were standing on the shoulders, as you've heard, of people in West Roxbury who had been part of this effort to do everything they could. Um, and I also talked about the proud tradition of civil disobedience that I've been a part of over many decades, civil disobedience on behalf of racial justice and economic justice, um, and that the people who came were part of a systematic campaign where people came to trainings, and they came to trainings so that when they stepped into that pipeline construction to stop it, they knew that they were ready for that, that they were ready for the consequences for it, and that they were also part of a blessed community of people committed to nonviolence and committed to social change. Thank you, something that I started talking about. Um, after one of the cases that got closest to being able to use the necessity defense that we wanted to put on, which was the Delta Five trial out in Washington in, in early 2015, and in, in that case, they were able to present the evidence, but they weren't able to make their, their final arguments and the jury wasn't allowed to rule on the necessity defense. Um, and, and the judge said that they hadn't met the burden of proving that there were no alternatives. And, and part of the problem in that case was that the prosecutor and the judge were able to frame things in, in this stark dichotomy between one, one planet on which people engage in lawful activism and one planet on which people engage in civil disobedience and no connection between the two, um, sort of this, this sterile separation that doesn't really exist in the real world. There's this, there's this interconnection. Um, and the judge was, would, and the prosecutor were trying to kind of set the bar of saying, you know, that if you're saying there's a necessity for civil disobedience, then you have to argue that, that that means everything within the law has to be entirely useless, that every other kind of, of advocacy has to be entirely useless. And they were constantly trying to question people that way, saying like, so do you mean this was entirely useless, all the other things you've done? And of course, that's not the reality. It just means that, that all those other things that we do on their own are not sufficient, that there's still more that, that needs to be done, and that civil disobedience can, can support those other kinds of act activism uh, and make them more powerful. But it occurred to me that the real argument there was about if there was something unique about civil disobedience, that other kinds of legal activism could not uh, achieve, that if there was something different that civil disobedience did. Uh, and, and I knew that there had to be because Almost every successful social movement in our history has used civil disobedience and has had to get to that point. Uh, and, and when I thought about that question about what's unique about civil disobedience, I came to this, this expression of vulnerability that civil disobedience represents. Because inherently, when you're engaging in that kind of nonviolent direct action, you're putting yourself in a vulnerable position and sort of inviting a a violent or repressive reaction from the state that you're protesting against. You, whether that's a, the physical violence, you know, as, as represented in, in the civil rights movement when people were getting beaten by cops and by mobs, or whether that's the sort of sanitized violence of the state that incarcerates people. Either way, you're, you're inviting that kind of reaction upon yourself and, and using your own vulnerability in a very public way. And I think why that's so uniquely powerful 
is because I think at the core of our human nature is our empathy. And, and I think our empathy is so strong that when we see people in a vulnerable position, we can't help but be moved by that. We can't help but pay attention and, and pay attention in a way that even breaks us out of our, our normal routines and that, that really embeds itself in our brains, which is such a huge challenge for us to break through all the other things that people have to worry about from you know, the, the incredibly important things that have, people have to worry about, of how to put food on the table and you know, you know, what's going on with their kids and that sort of thing to the silly things that people worry about. Of what, what, what's, you know, when is their favorite TV show on and that sort of stuff. Um, that, that that empathy is strong enough to break people out of that and get them to pay attention to something that they wouldn't otherwise pay attention to. And, and there are very few things that, that can tap into that empathy the way that our vulnerability can when we're engaging in civil disobedience. And that's why, that's why as a strategy, it's so uniquely powerful because it taps into the core of who we are as human beings with, with that empathy. Uh, we were in and out of the courtroom for about uh, 10 or 11 months. And the first few months were because uh, Spectre didn't show up, and then they did show up, and then they said Spectre doesn't do business in Massachusetts. And then the lawyer who said that, it's like, well, who does? Well, how long? Well, who represents them? Well, I do. And it went on like that with us asking for information from Spectre Energy and then not giving it to us and then finally giving it to us in a form that was totally unacceptable. And the judge, who is a resident of West Roxbury, began to get more and more impatient. And then the moment came um, where we said, well, you've given some things, but you haven't turned over the safety plan. And he said, we don't have a safety plan. We don't need to have a safety plan. And he said, you know, we met with the first responders and they're fine with this. And she turned to him and said, then why is the city appealing this case? And so, in a way, and then she, she said to him, you will either produce a safety plan or you will produce an affidavit that you don't have one, which is, you know, a formal testimony. And that's what they did. So part of this whole process, by the time we got to what we thought might be the trial, um, we had flushed out Spectra as not having a safety plan, which is enormously frightening for the people of West Roxbury. I want to know whether you smiled when your mugshot was taken when you were arrested. <laughs> they never sent me my mugshot. I don't question But I mean, you were there. I don't you remember. Oh. I do remember that after they put me in the holding cell, I did a quick glissando up and down, found the resident frequency of the room, and then sang for three hours. Nice. We don't get to celebrate enough. This is a huge victory, and it's a humble cake. But please, everybody, have a piece, and let's really try to stretch this celebration as much as possible to give us the energy to keep fighting and keep going. And then there's resist, and I, I don't know what to say about resist because, boy. I didn't know there was such a possibility uh, that people could have the strength, the determination, the knowledge, the, just the love, I guess, to come and do what they did in our community. And I thank them all.